back. So um, um, we are looking at um, the Anthropocene. We are in the Anthropocene. And when we think of Anthropocene, we think mostly climate change, uh, which is uh, probably the, most, the biggest keyword. But the other one, the other big elephant in the room is land changes, as we have seen. And you're not talking about forestry or agriculture, you're talking about multiple uh, drivers. And everything together creates cumulative impacts. So the cumulative impact is given by climate, land use changes, and all our drivers. Does it matter? Well, uh, yes, uh, we, I don't have to repeat all what my colleagues have said previously, but the latest APBS report says clearly that cumulative impacts are the drivers of the 75% land loss we have seen in recent uh, years and the unprecedented nature decline and extinction rates that we are seeing now. So it's the cumulative Im impact. It's not one thing, it's all together. And that's why it's, in my opinion, uh, incredible, shocking, I would say, that actually we don't have yet a science-based definition for cumulative impact. Like cumulative impact of what, on what, and how do we measure them? There's no kind of recipe that scientists can just use and apply. And if we don't have a recipe for it, we don't have even a definition for it, it's actually quite difficult for us scientists to try to actually aid sustainable land planning. We're all talking about it, but actually, we're not really on top of it scientifically. So uh, why is it so difficult? Why don't we have a definition or anything like that? Uh, first of all, it's difficult to define. This is a landscape, I work a lot on reindeer, so this is a mountain landscape in Norway. And Norway is not the most uh, anthropogenic impacted land on Earth. Still, you see uh, a few roads, a few skiers, maybe a wind power plant or a hydropower plant, uh, all kind of infrastructure that per se may or may not be very uh, substantial, very big. But all together, all together in the same place, in the same time, they create a cumulative impact. And so what we do is know is that we don't know what, how to define them, but intuitively we can see that it's all these things together that, Im that create a cumulative impact. And what we know for sure is that if we don't understand how to measure them, we cannot possibly give really sustainable uh, uh, instruction or support to land planning. So we're trying to, to um, we spent the last uh, 10 years or so in trying to build, to contribute, <laughs> building a framework for measuring cumulative impacts. Uh, of climate and land use changes. And uh, we are thinking about this, that climate and land use, they both act in one place at one time. I mean, they're not just abstract concepts, they impact biodiversity there and then. So, and they do it in two different ways. One is they create habitat loss, or anyway, habitat changes. As we've seen, climate change is not always mm, negative, but still it changes uh, the land. Uh, on the other side, it fragments the land. So these are the two mechanisms that we are identifying as crucial to understand cumulative impacts. And what we are trying to do is to create a framework to bring them together. So this arrow is the crucial point and how to measure this together. But of course, this is uh, the reason why we don't have a framework in science is because this is not so easy to do. It would require that we work on species habitat use, on species movement, on population dynamics, on landscape connectivity, we need a huge amount of data because we need remote sensing and whatever. We need uh, efficient algorithms if you want to make some uh, models that actually are useful for real land planning, not just theoretical models, but concrete land planning. We need really big data and big algorithm and software development. And all these things have been developed in the last years, quite a lot, but usually in parallel disciplines, in disciplines that develop very much on their own track. So, what we are trying to do now is we are trying to bring them together, to put together the pieces of the puzzle and pick the interesting bits in each of these disciplines and kind of create a coherent framework to study cumulative impact and hopefully aid a little bit land planning. Concretely, I work a lot like my predecessor on, on reindeer, in this case at least. We work on uh, most of Norway and a bit of Sweden and we look at conservation and land planning. Is it a challenge? Well, yeah, it seems that uh, at least society is quite concerned with land planning and reindeer. Um, this is a, an area in uh, South Norway, Blöche, is one of the biggest uh, hydropower now. But at that time, or well, the picture here in the 30s, there was no hydropower built. So the reindeer could move a bit freely in all this area here. And then they built the hydropower dam. And then, of course, with the hydropower come the access roads, come the, the power line, 
come the cabins, the DNT hit there, because usually it's a nice area, so you build more and more. And this is the landscape now. The reindeer now don't really manage to get here anymore. So how we do model, how we try to understand this cumulative impact is this. First, we try to study the impact of each infrastructure, of each driver, climate, or, or uh, each infrastructure, like for example a cabin, on land loss in case of reindeer. So we try to measure how much habitat is lost due to a cabin, a DNT hitte, or maybe a tiny little private cabin, or maybe a road, and so on and so on. Then we try to see how these things affect, each of the same thing affect fragmentation. Because maybe a DNT hitte is not necessarily here and there fragmenting the habitat, but the combination of all this infrastructure here does create a blockage for reindeer movement. And then, and this is the crucial part, we try to bring it together. And we tried to, we kind of came up with a new metric which we call functional habitat. So what is the green thing? What is actually there for reindeer? What can they use that is good quality and accessible at the same time? Because if there is good habitat here, yeah, good, but they cannot get there. So we are trying to get one metric. Once we have that metric, then we can play with the environment. We can simulate, what if I remove this road? What if I remove this thing here? How does the, the functional habitat change? Does it increase, decrease? And so this is our approach. Uh, the workflow is, uh, as I said, this is another way to show the workflow. So we start with a lot of data, we work a lot on GPS data, but we can use any, uh, even expert-based opinion to, to create uh, habitat quality and permeability maps. Once we have done this, we try to bring them together. And as I said, I'm not gonna describe how we do it, but all this discipline come together here, mathematical formula, connectivity modeling, and basically we try to see uh, how each pixel or each unit in the landscape connect to each other pixel. If I was a reindeer, how do I get there? Taking into account how good the habitat is and how permeable it is. And we come up with these two um, maps here that are describing what is the functional habitat. This is what is good and accessible. And these are the movement corridors. And instead then we can play and do scenarios to predict what is the impact of planned uh, infrastructure and identify priority areas for conservation. I just show you how we do it in the case of wild reindeer. <clears throat> this is habitat quality, this is fragmentation, this is south of Norway. And these are our two, this is a study area which I don't mention because the results are preliminary but some of you may recognize it. So these are, this is the functional habitat, the best habitat as that could be good habitat here, but this is not accessible. So this is the, the core habitat. And these are the corridors. In some study, we can also call these green infrastructures because that's what, what they are actually. Uh, and we do, in this example, we try to simulate what happens if we m try to mitigate the effect of, of infrastructure. So local uh, stakeholders told us that, well, maybe we could remove this cabin and this trail, or we could remove this road, or we could remove everything together. So let's see what happened. Then we, this is a quality again, and focus on this area and this area. Now we try to remove the infrastructure and we simulate what happened. You see that they get greener in this case, and in this case they get whiter. So in this case they get, the, the preferred habitat increases, and in that case the preferred habitat, uh, sorry, the, the, the traversability of the habitat becomes higher, so animals can move more freely. And if you put it together, this is what happened. So uh, the functional habitat, what is the good and connected habitat, increases in this case of 19%. And the, the corridors, I should say that here there used to be a migration corridor that is gone because of this infrastructure. If you remove this infrastructure, we would recreate a lost corridor. We have done this, so this is the result for the three different scenarios. So in this case, if you remove only this one, we get 9%. In this case, we get 8%. And if you remove everything, you get 20%. And we have done this for several areas in Norway. So we see what is the, we predict the efficacy of mitigation measure. In the same way, we can also see uh, what, what happens if you build your infrastructure. So the next project, we are gonna test the effect of, of uh, uh, the land development strategy, like the National Transport Plan, if, if we apply these plans that the government is making, so what is the impact of it? Um, we also, the same approach has been considered for land planning in the municipalities in Norway, 
We have applied it to a commune now in Xi uh, on bees, insects, and moose, and we try to see what are the green infrastructure or the the, the movement corridors and the functional habitat for these animals. And we're trying to see how to put it together to see, to find multi-species corridors. And uh, last, we, we will bring this available online because we are kind of collaborating with a quite famous uh, software platform and we will put this available for everybody online. I conclude with one thought. Um, I believe we are in a, the Anthropocene has been defined as a big multidimensional challenge that requires new way of thinking and I would add a new way for us scientists to collaborate. I don't think that we have met the challenge, as the IPBS report shows. We are not managing to do sustainable land planning, let's, let's face it. Uh, none of us can do it alone, no project, I didn't do it for sure, uh, no discipline. And I think we need to add new perspective and new pieces to the puzzle that I was trying to show at the beginning. So we need more collaboration, we need more sharing, more data, and thank you very much.